So, uh, now it's time for uh, Gamla Sala, and uh, this is a place I've been working with for, for a few decades now, ever since I was a fresh PhD student. Uh, we've had a, we started a research project here in uh, 2009 that has shifted up and downwards in scale, uh, called the Guam Project. Now it's taking a, a new turn. It, it's uh, Gamla Uppsala is related to two other pro uh, projects, Viking Dynasties, founded by Kru Ager Fonden in Denmark, and the Viking Phenomena Project, led by Neil Fries, Uppsala University, founded by, funded by Vetenskapsrådet. And um, Gamla Uppsala is, um, is a, an, a place with many functions, and I will not go into if it, whether it's urban or not. But it is, uh, it is an assembly site where, with uh, strong uh, ritual and judicial functions. It's placed in a plain landscape where seven different valleys meet, which means that it is very centrally placed in the landscape. And also, it is a major royal seat with uh, quite a high population. Uh, with with the latest estimation from the railway project, the contract dig, that where a major book was just published a month ago, they estimate that the surrounding village consists between 30 and 50 farms surrounding the, the manor area. And there, of course, another element related to central places in the urban site is the crafts. And I will here focus upon the metal crafts that we have in Gamla Uppsala. I will work much more with that in the coming two years. So this is just some observations that will be more substantial in the future, hopefully. So we're in the middle Sweden. This map shows the, uh, the Viking Age water levels where we have Helge. I will mention later on Birka, the town, later Sigtuna town, and then Balser and Gamla Uppsala at the top. And this is a site where that's highly populated in the centuries BC, where we have scattered clusters of farms sort of in the valley bottom. But then in the set, sixth century, we see an abandonment of these farms and a clear concentration where we later have the historical village in Gamla Uppsala. So the darker areas to the left are clusters of farms that now must be revised after the new result. And it, with adjacent gray fields next to the, to the clusters of farms. And by then we also see a clear distinguish, we can distinguish between two major social elements of, of the site, with the, the manor area with the monumental mounds in the middle of in the high ground, and the manor settlement over here, and then blue, the surrounding village areas. <coughs> so, we, in the village area, we have done in the project a number of surveys. Uh, LBI has, in other cases, been there with uh, GeoRadar, separate projects, we had a lot of con small contract digs, and the big railway project that has made a transect through the village. And they've discovered between six to 10 farms from different places from the Vendel period uh, up until the early medieval period. And the characteristic thing, I, I must also say that the, the results from this project is not fully, fully publicated yet. The reports are not published, so it's, it's a bit hard for me to fully understand what the, the, the amount of, of crafts material. But it seems like when we have this part of the village, the, uh, the craft, the metal crafts are quite sparse. There are no really high concentrations. When, but when we move towards the central area, there are vague indications that we have substantial metal uh, iron smithing and also um, bronze casting uh, in these areas. But most of this is survey material. So there's still there are quite vague indications of a large-scale production in in this part of the Uppsala. But the situation seems to be a bit different when we are get, when we are in the in the manor area. This is a reconstruction where we have loads of houses, but actually there's only been a few percentages of the total area has been excavated. But we know there are houses 
have different features everywhere. And here we have at least two certain workshops. One here, one here, on either side of the Great Hall on a, on a huge artificial terrace. Uh, workshop one on a major terrace, workshop two also on a terrace, and as soon as we make smaller excavations, we find scattered debris of um, bronze casting, iron smithy, smithing, and bead making, but we don't find the actual workshop sites, but the material is scattered over large areas. So, workshop one. On this terrace, we have the garnet production. We have a few fragments of molten and refined glass that seems to be originated from bead making. Uh, we have iron smithing and fragments of one fragment of comb making. That's the only fragment from the entire gun loop solid with comb making, the, the thing that is characteristic for Viking Age town. But we do have a huge production of garnets that seems to be local. So in just three, X, three square meters of the floor layers, we found 600 pieces of, of raw garnets. And this seems to be a building. We've only excavated a very small part of the building, but it stands on a terrace that could hold a house that it could have been 40 meters long. And we have indications from the trench that there are a number of rooms where different types of crafts are, are made. For example, in this room with multiple sand layers with the garnets, an adjacent room that is pitch black with a lot of smithing, uh, smithing remains. And this stands in sharp contrast to the village area where all the known uh, crafts remains are made from, are in small buildings or in open air activities. And then we have workshop two, just 10 meters from the Great Hall. And this is also a very large terrace that might be as long as 100 meters long with a 40 centimeter thick culture layer. And we've only skimmed an area of less than 10 square meters and only picked away 5 to 10 centimeters of this culture layer. And we have evidence of silver wire and filigree wire production, uh, cloisonne production, uh, both gold and silver, uh, refined garnets. We have raw amber, refined glass for bead made, molds and crucible, etc., etc. So, and here you can find the, uh, the draw, you can see the draw plate from for silver wire production. So it seems we haven't excavated large amounts of these workshops, but the density of finds is extremely high. So we seem to have a high concentration of in the production. And, and just as I said, that we, if you compare it, for example, with Birka, where they excavated a complete bronze workshop with tens of thousands of mold fragments and crucibles and so on, and uh, other cases in the urban context, we don't have that mass material, because, but it's partly because we have excavated so incredibly small areas, but the density is extremely high. So it seems, in comparison with the village area, with the small houses and open air activities, <coughs> it, the, the people that decide in the manor area want, seems to want to build big houses where they, uh, and draw, them, draw a number of workshops to this area. And uh, so it seems to be some kind of large scale production in, in the manor area. And that this, this stands in a quite a sharp contrast to Helia, because in Helia, the other migration period, vandal period, central place in this area, we have the manor area here with the whole complex where there is substantial metal crop <coughs> there and smith as well, but the highest density of activities is in the surrounding areas, in the surrounding farmsteads. So Gamla Uppsala and Helge are partly contemporary, but it is, seems to be a completely different pattern in the, in the 
crafts activities. And it's a long way to go. This are not the class. This is the pre-emporia period. So I think in the future we have quite good evidence to see what they did before in Crafts way before the emporias were established. It's, good. it's a, quite a different pattern in specialized production. Finished. Thank you.